You look up some of the ice or just ice arena nearby. <laughs> All right. I feel like uh, I feel like Friday's yeah, session went pretty well. Formal charge makes sense. It seems like maybe making those thought structures make more sense. Structures kind of are one of those things where the more you get to practice them, the more detail you learn about what's going on behind the scenes, the more they kind of make sense. Um, I I tend I remember being being a student and learning Lewis dot structures and it was just like a random process I had to learn. It didn't really make any sense or why we'd need it, but then formal charge made it make more sense. Um, so we'll start with some some practice and then we're going to talk about how it affects the shapes of the molecules and why the shapes of the molecules are important. All right. So for starters, let's review what we did Friday. Um, let's let's do Lewis stop structures for chlorate and nitric acid. Then we'll go through them. All right, so remember, a reminder, if you spent all weekend not thinking about chemistry and now can't remember what formal charge is or Lewis dot structures for that matter. Start with our Lewis dot structures. Our, I guess our goals are one, right number of electrons. Second priority, build valences. A third priority is what? How do you know what goes in the middle here? Uh, most, vacant, uh, most vacancies usually, yeah. except not in this case. The one that makes the, uh, the formal charges. The formal charges closest to zero. That's Joel. Remember that formal charge was when we were looking at how many electrons they have on the periodic table versus in our Lewis structure, how many electrons did they own? Remember bonds counted for half the electrons. Formal charge closest to zero. So the easiest way to think about what goes in the middle was was most vacancies, right? But in the absence of, if we're not quite sure, neither of these look like they should really be in the middle. Like we don't usually put oxygens in the middle. Chlorine only has one vacancy, but what does chlorine have? It has, what row is it on the periodic table? Third row, which means it has what? It's in the third energy level, therefore it has What's that thing that ruins everything, makes everything more complicated? D orbitals, right? 
chlorine's got a d orbital so even though it only has one vacancy it can make more bonds than just one bond all right so we're going to put chlorine in the middle we're going to try to see if we can make something work if that doesn't work we'll come back and we'll put an oxygen in the middle see if we can make a better lewis dot structure all right when worst comes to worst you only have two options so put one of them in the middle see if you can make it so that the formal charges look okay and if not try it again so we're going to put chlorine in the middle we're going to surround it by oxygens right three oxygens i told i totaled up our valence electrons over here to start Chlorine brings seven, seven valence electrons. Oxygens each bring three valent, or six valence electrons, and there's three of them. And we've got a negative one charge. Negative one charge means one extra electron, right? If we had something with a positive charge, we'd be subtracting an electron, right? We're just using the, top, the charge to adjust the total number of electrons we have to work with. So that gives us, Three times six is 18 plus another eight gives us 26, I think. And again, I say total, but really I mean total valence electrons. What do we do to start? Start with the bonds, right? We know that there have to be some bonds here. So let's just start attaching things. How many electrons did I use? Six. So now we're down 20 electrons left. How many do, does each oxygen still need? Six more electrons, right? You'll see, you'll start to notice a common theme with the oxygens in these Lewis dot structures. The oxygens are almost always going to be on the outside. And after you draw your first set of bonds, your oxygens still all need six electrons, right? So we'll be able to start we'll be able to use another 18 of our 20 electrons. All right, how many do we have left now? So where do they go? You gotta use them, they have to be in here. Chlorine still needs a pair of electrons to have eight, doesn't it? All right, step one complete. Did we satisfy criteria two? Fun, fun fact about the English language. Did you guys know criteria is plural? Does anybody know what the singular is for criteria? Criterion, which is a weird sounding word. It's like data, data is a plural word. Does anybody know what the singular of data is? Datum, D-A-T-U-M. Data is a collection of data points. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. So did we satisfy the second criterion? Oxygens look good. Chlorine looks good too. How about number three? What's the formal, all the oxygens are identical, right? So it means we can do the formal charge for all the oxygens at once. So what is that? So formal charge is equal to number of electrons on periodic table minus number of electrons owned. Or just look at, did it gain electrons or lose electrons? And what's that, what does that do? How many electrons do, do the oxygens all own? Seven. Seven each and where are they on, how many do they have on the periodic table? Six. Six. So each oxygen has a charge of minus one or negative one, just as correct. 
probably more correct to say negative one. What about the chlorine? How many electrons does it own? Five. And what does it have on the periodic table? So plus two. So did we do our formal charges correctly? We, we determined them correctly because they add up to negative one. Our overall molecule is negative one, right? So that means all of our formal charges together, a plus two and then three negative ones adds up to minus one. So we did the process properly. Is there another way we can arrange this so that the formal charges get closer to zero? One double bond? Why not? Well, one of the oxygens wouldn't be the same as the others, but we've seen that before. We saw it with nitrate, right? And remember we had that conversation about how, well, really it's like it's being shared between all the oxygens at the same time, but we just draw it like it's going to one oxygen. So what would that do? Let's say we did took this bottom oxygen. Can we do that? Now the chlorine has extra electrons. It still has the pair. We didn't get rid of the pair. That's still there. What looks weird about this? What's wrong about this, if anything? pairs of electrons not owned but how many total pairs of electrons around the chlorine who's that five can we have five pairs of electrons around one atom not normally but what does chlorine have the, we'll see we're going to start one at a time but yeah so because the chlorine's in the third row of the periodic table it can go more than eight electrons. To fill the valences, to fill the orbitals, everything past helium needs at least eight electrons. The second row needs exactly eight electrons. But once you get to the third row, you can go past eight electrons if it lowers your overall formal charge, gets everything closer to zero. What's the, what's the formal charge on this oxygen with the double bond now? zero, which we normally would say, hey, that, that's a good thing that gets us closer to, or that's more stable, right? What does that do to the chlorine? What's the formal charge on the chlorine? It was, sorry, it was plus two when it controlled five electrons. We gave it an extra electron by making a new bond, right? Now it controls six electrons. So it's a plus one. So that's a better Lewis dot structure, right? Because our last criteria is we want to get the formal charges as close to possible, as close to zero as possible. Are we done? Why not? You could do one more. We dropped our formal charge from plus two to plus one by making one double bond. Why don't we do it again? Which oxygen are we gonna have share? Left, right, bottom. Would we wanna do it here? It's already zero. We don't wanna mess with this oxygen anymore. Pick one of the other two oxygens make another double bond. Now both of the oxygens that have double bonds have formal charge zero, right? And they're stable, that makes it more stable. What's the formal charge on the chlorine now? Zero. So the, where we first started, where we just put the chlorine in the middle, we distributed everything, all the oxygens just had a single bond, 
that was a Lewis dot structure that meet the first two criteria. No, in up to this point, that would have been good enough, right? But now we're bringing in the d orbital, and now we're talking about formal charge. This is a better Lewis dot structure, more accurate Lewis dot structure, because it keeps all the formal charges closest to zero. Any questions on when you're allowed to break the octet rule? Or a different question, sure. So if we drew the chlorine with a negative one charge, that's gonna be, or if we drew all of them with double bonds, now all of the oxygens are zero and that gives the chlorine a minus one charge, right? because now the chlorine has eight electrons around it, or it owns eight electrons, because it controls half of all the bonds. That's what, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and it controls half of them, so there's six, plus the lone pair that it owns outright. This is also just as valid. This is just as correct as having one now it is anyway. Don't forget to erase lone pairs when you make new pi bonds. This is just as correct. Um, we haven't talked about electronegativity yet in any any sort of detail. Uh, we'll, we're going to do that today. We'll find out, okay, well, if you have a choice to give two structures where you can put a negative chart, a negative one on one of two places, it turns out the one that is least electronegative winds up being the best option usually. And electronegative usually means, more electronegative means closer to fluorine generally. Well, oxygen and chlorine are both directly adjacent to fluorine. If you look up values, you'll see that, um, Chlorine is slightly less electronegative than oxygen. Electronegativity basically is, a, is how well does this element share with others? Oxygen and fluorine are bullies. They don't share well with others. If they're sharing electrons, it's really like fluorine gets to play with the electrons and then, and then the little kid watches, right? It's not really sharing when you're forced to share your toys with your big brother. I don't know, maybe in your family dynamics, but I know that I was that big brother to my little brother. So. Um, so if we have to choose where to put a negative charge, typically we want, we're going to put it on the more electronegative element, which in this case is oxygen. So that one is the chlorine having a negative one and all the oxygen being zero is also valid. And I'm not going to split hairs. If you drew either one of those on the test, I'd consider them both full credit answers, but this is a little bit more correct. Any other questions about Lewis dot structures at this point or formal charge? It's really two sides of the same thing, right? You can't really do Lewis dot structures and know that you did your, your best if you don't also check the formal charges. Let's see, we did nitrate We did nitrate on Friday, so we could do nitric acid. Um, or what's, let's see, what's another polyatomic ion? Just pick one off the top of your head. Um, ammonium. Okay, ammonium, that's a plus one charge. That's a little different, that's good. Let's do ammonium. We'll do one more after this because we'll do one more where we practice breaking the octet rule. But this is a good one because it's got a positive charge instead of a negative charge. And this one's actually really simple, really straightforward. No positive charge. How many electrons do we have to work with? Well, nitrogen brings five electrons, right? And there's one, one nitrogen. And each 
hydrogen brings one electron, right? And there are four of them. And it's a positive charge. So instead of having extra electrons, most of the polyatomics have a negative charge, which means extra electrons, right? Positive charge just means what? We get rid of one electron. So we have eight electrons to work with. What's gonna go in the middle? Nitrogen, why? Most open spaces. And how many electrons can hydrogen have when it has a full valence? Just two, right? Which means one bond. So nitrogen will never, or sorry, hydrogen will never be in the middle because you can't, can't be in the middle if you can only make one bond. At most, it's one of two that are even, right? So if we put nitrogen in the middle, hydrogen's around it, you look concerned, Derek. You just said you only have one bond. Correct. Each hydrogen can only have one bond. Oh. And there are four of them. So we know we have to have four hydrogens around the nitrogen. We have eight electrons to work with. Where do we start? Make the bonds. Make the bonds. We used eight electrons. Number one's done. Do we fill all the valences? Yeah. Is there even a different way we could arrange them? Not, no, not really. So you don't even need your formal charge for this one, but let's look at the formal charge just, to, just for the sake of practice. What's the formal charge on each hydrogen? Each hydrogen has two electrons around it, it owns, it owns half of that. So one electron for each hydrogen, we're good there. What about the nitrogen in the middle? Plus one. Plus one, it's, it owns four electrons and it started with five. Sorry, plus one. Zero is the hydrogens. So the plus charge didn't really change much. In fact, having only hydrogens makes things really pretty straightforward because the fact that it's hydrogen is very limiting. You're not going to ever see double bonds with hydrogen. You're never going to have hydrogen in the middle. And the only other possible way you could think about arranging this would be if you had nitrogen to a hydrogen to another hydrogen. But we can't do that, right? That should look really wrong to you, right? Because not only, so we're out of electrons, nitrogen doesn't have a lone pair yet, or doesn't have a full octet yet. And we have a hydrogen with two bonds. That doesn't make any sense, right? That would give this hydrogen a minus one formal charge and the nitrogen doesn't even have a full valence. This no, just no. We know better than that. So that's a good one to look at. How about acetate? What the heck do we do with acetate? This is actually where we're headed next. So acetate, C2H3O2 with a minus one charge. How many electrons do we have to work with? A good amount. Two carbons, and each carbon has four valence electrons. Two oxygens that each brings six and three hydrogens that each bring one electron 
and we've got a negative one charge. So add one more at the end. So carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, charge. 28, is that what I heard? 24. Well, that part has more lines than normal, but it doesn't look any different, really. What are we going to do, though? Two carbons in the middle? We have two carbons. Carbon has the fewest bond, or the fewest, um, or has the most vacancies. So put carbon in the middle, but we have two carbons. You could put two carbons next to each other, I guess, right? Bonded to each other? Why not? Let's see what happens. We got to put the rest of this arranged around here somehow too, right? So we have three hydrogens and two oxygens we still need to put around there. Can carbon have more than four things attached to it? Why not? It has four vacancies in its in its valence shell, but we just did chlorate and chlorine, chlorine only has one vacancy and it made like six bonds plus a double bond, right? Five bonds plus a double bond. So, what what allowed chlorine to do that? The d orbital. Does carbon have a d orbital? Nothing in the second row of the periodic table will ever have more than four bonds or four pairs of electrons around it. But we have five things that still need to be attached. How is that going to work? We have two different carbons that can each have four bonds. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two different center atoms. Each carbon you could think of as being its own center atom. So we could have one carbon that's got the hydrogens around it and then it's attached to another carbon. That used eight of our electrons, right? which means 16 electrons left. The other carbon, just put the two oxygens there. They have to be attached as well, right? So might as well do our initial. How many electrons do we just use? Another four. So now we're down to 12 electrons left. Each oxygen still needs another 12, right? Our hydrogens are good. Each oxygen still needs six. And we have 12 electrons left. So we could fill it up. We're done with the electrons now. Step one, done. Are all the valences filled? Hydrogens, yes. This carbon, yes. That carbon, no. Oxygens are good though, right? Bingo. When we run out of electrons and we need one more pair of electrons to a, to a central atom, just make a, a double bond. Right number of electrons. Now we filled all the valences. Are our formal charges all close to zero? The hydrogens are all identical, right? Hydrogen with one bond, we've seen that before. Hydrogen with one bond is a formal charge of zero. So our hydrogens are good. The oxygens are not the same, so we're gonna have to look at both of them separately. But let's look at the carbons first. This carbon, how many electrons does it own? Four, and how many does it have on the periodic table? 
four. So a carbon with four bonds is a charge of zero. So same thing here, the bonds look different, but there's still four bonds to this central carbon, right? So this carbon also has a formal charge of zero. How many does this bottom oxygen control own? Six. Six. And how many does it have on the periodic table? So the bottom oxygen's good. Top oxygen. One bond, three that it owns outright, so it controls seven. It has six on the periodic table, right? So everything's zero except for that, that one oxygen by itself that only has one bond, which is good because all of our charges are supposed to add up to zero, right? So all of our same rules for doing these Lewis dot structures apply to larger molecules. You just start looking at each individual atom as though it's its own center atom when it comes to drawing these Lewis dot structures. Um, defining what you're going to call the central atom is really sort of just defining your frame of reference. And as we start zooming out and seeing larger and larger molecules, it's going to make less and less sense to think of one atom as being the center of a molecule. Acetate doesn't have a central atom. It has carbons and oxygens. Right, and as you start getting things like amino acids, for instance, they're going to have a whole bunch of blue, of uh, central atoms. So if you had something like, I won't mess with that right now. And I'm, I always mix up my names on these. I believe this is isoleucine. Every single one of those carbons and nitrogens could be considered a central atom if we're looking at the shape of that individual atom. And every single one of them individually, you could look at and say, okay, what's the formal charge on that atom? You could look at this card and say, what's well, a carbon with four bonds? Therefore, it's formal charge of zero. Same for all these ones. All the hydrogens have a formal charge of zero. We've got a nitrogen with four bonds there. We saw that example with ammonium a minute ago, didn't we? So a nitrogen with four bonds is a formal charge of plus one. On this side, we've got carbon double bonded to an oxygen. I didn't draw the lone pairs. If I did, it would look something like this. Carbon double bonded to an oxygen. That oxygen's a formal charge of zero, right? This oxygen has a formal charge of minus one, just like the acetate we just looked at. So a lot of times we get to larger molecules and I wouldn't be able to expect you to do like this entire thing off the top of your head. You guys don't have the, the background yet to be able to do that. But as we get to larger molecules, what we'll see is a lot of times you'll just see them labeled with their formal charge on the individual atoms because we're, um, we're assuming everything's got a formal charge of zero unless we specify otherwise. Turns out that's usually not a bad way to do it. But again, we'll get more practice before I would expect you to be able to do. I, in this class, I'm not going to have you draw the Lewis dot structure for isoleucine and label all the formal charge. That's, that's beyond this class. I'm just giving you an example of how it works when we get to larger molecules. Um, who knows what amino acids, where they're found in nature? Proteins. You string together a bunch of amino acids, you make proteins out of them with peptide bonds. Um, the smallest amino, the smallest protein commonly found in, in mammals, um, or one of the smallest anyway, the best known of the small proteins is called insulin. Does anybody know how many amino acids are linked together to make insulin? About 120. I want to say it's 122. So you can very, very quickly, 
we zoom out and things start being much, much larger than this. We start stringing together the same logic we're doing here and applying it to bigger systems very quickly. The largest protein I can come up off the top of my head, I guess we'd go with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is about 600 amino acids, I want to say. It's four subunits that are each 150-ish amino acids. Um, and so you wind up with giant, giant molecules in terms of their overall formulas. All right. Is everybody feeling... A Maybe ending with the challenging one wasn't, wasn't, uh... no, let's do one more. We break the octet rule and then we'll move on. All right. So something with sulfur or chlorine or bromine in the middle, polyatomic ion from your list. So we did sulfite on Friday. You would know if you watched the recording. Yeah. Then again, the recording is an hour and a half of the camera pointed at the whiteboard. So, I just like skip through. Um, how about how about per bromate? Bromates are on your list, aren't they? Yeah. So bromates and chlorates follow the same rules. So it's the same formula. So per bromate, it's going to be our O4 with a negative one charge. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? Quite a few, seven times seven electrons and one times one bromine, right? And then six electrons and then with the four oxygens. And then there's a minus one charge. Six times four is 24. 25 and seven is 32. What are we gonna put in the middle? Bromine. So again, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about electronegativity yet, but basically oxygen is, is the second worst at sharing out of any of the elements on the periodic table. Fluorine's the absolute worst sharing. Oxygen's the second worst. So basically, oxygen's never gonna go in the middle as a central atom. If you have any other element around, it's better than at sharing than oxygen is. So don't put the oxygen in the middle. They don't share at all. They're only children that never leave the house. If you look at historically, if you look at the etymology of noble gases, there you can either think of them being noble gases. They're noble in the sense that they're British stiff upper lip. They don't show any reaction when something happens. Um, or the more accurate way, um, the noble gases behave like nobles as in they don't do anything. Um, so ignoring the noble gases because they don't do anything. Oxygen is the second most electronegative. So bromine goes in the middle, surrounded by oxygens. Let's start with our bonds, right? We just used eight, so we have 24 electrons left. Where do they go? The oxygens, we started the outside, work your way in. And again, because oxygen's so bad at sharing, you might as well give oxygens the, all the electrons first and then make oxygen share if you have to. So I'm drawing just to keep, when we get to these larger molecules where we have lots of, of lone pairs, um, a lot of times I draw them in these little circles. I think I've shown you that before, but just for the sake of making sure none of the lone pairs get lost since dots can be kind of hard to see. How many electrons do we have left? Zero. 
right, we started with 32. We used four in our bonds, and then we had 24 left. 24 times six, or four times six. Each oxygen still needed six electrons, and there were four of them. Zero left. Step one, check. Step two, check. Step three, what are we going to do to make all of the formal charges as low as possible, as close to zero as possible? Double bonds where we, where we need to. What's the formal charge on bromine? As it's drawn here. Plus three, right? It owns four, elect four electrons and it has seven on the periodic table. So if it starts plus three, how many double bonds are we gonna need? Three double bonds. Every time we make a double bond to the bromine, it lowers the charge by one, right? So pick four or three oxygens and delete lone pairs. Delete, erase lone pairs. Formal charge on the bromine is now zero, right? Seven bonds, no lone pairs. So seven bonds means it's got own seven electrons and it has seven on the periodic table. This oxygen is a minus one. Each of these are zero. So this is gonna be our most stable Lewis dot structure or per bromate. And not that I would expect you to memorize these, but it's gonna look very, very similar for perchlorate, right? Perchlorate was the same exact formula, just with a chlorine instead of a bromine, right? So what's perchlorate gonna look like? There's perchlorate, easy enough, right? Once you know how breaking the octet rule works and how formal charge works, it's not that hard to sort of rearrange things to get it as close to zero as you, as possible. Of course, everything's easy when I'm the one up here with the marker and the blank sheet of paper, right? When you sit down at home with a blank piece of paper and try and do this on your own, it's gonna feel a lot harder. You're gonna get lost on where to start. So just start by drawing a Lewis dot structure, whether it's right or wrong, it'll give you something to work from. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns about Lewis dot structures at this point? Cool. I'm, I'm hoping that's cool that nobody has any questions. Not everybody's so lost that you don't even know how to formulate your questions. Um, all right, let's talk about one of the places where these Lewis dot structures wind, wind up being really, really useful in terms of things like predicting macroscopic properties, um, predicting what compounds are stable. All right, so if we look at what's going on at the molecular, at the atomic level, we know that pretty much all of the volume of an atom is made up of electrons, right? We've talked about that before, haven't we? We talked about baseball stadiums standing on pitcher's mounds. If you go to Oracle Park and you stand on the pitcher's mound with baseball, baseball is about the size of the nucleus. And the rest of the stadium is about the size of a hydrogen atom. Most of the atom is made up of the electron clouds. We also know electrons are negatively charged. All right, it's boring, right? Where are we going with this? Similar charges repel each other. So if we have a bunch of groups of electrons around a central atom or a, a central nucleus, what are they going to do to each other? Push each other away, right? They're going to repel each other. Fun. So I've mentioned Feynman's name before when we talked about quantum. Um, he's one of those, one of those scientists using the like this probably third generation of quantum mechanics, quantum physicists. So he worked on the Manhattan Project in Oppenheimer, but if he had any screen time, it would have been like one roll because he was really, really low down on the totem pole at that point. Um, 
but he won a Nobel Prize well after that, basically for designing a way that you could just draw um, how things repel each other or how different particles interact. Um, so this is what's called a Feynman diagram. And all it's really showing is if you have two electrons moving towards each other, they're gonna at some point get close enough, they're going to push each other away. So all that chart is showing, but you don't have to show any math to do that. Um, so makes sense. Electrons push away other electrons, right? Which means if you have two groups of electrons around a central atom, they're going to naturally arrange themselves so that they're as far apart from each other as possible. The thing is they can't really get that far apart in terms of distance because, well, why can't they? If you have, why wouldn't the electrons just be like, you know, meters apart instead of both attached to the same atom still? What's keeping them attached to the same atom? The positive charge of the protons and the fact that most of the time they're going to be, and when we're using this sort of framework, we're talking about electrons that have to be in two valences at the same time. Or what type of bond? Covalent. A covalent bond means it has to be in two valences at the same time. So we're limited. We can't just physically split, split these electrons up as far apart as possible. They're limited by they both still have to be attached to that central atom, attached. They both have to be still in the same vicinity as that central atom. So what actually happens is they wind up arranging themselves using angles, not using angles like they um, you know, are planning things out or anything like that. Things will naturally move away from each other so that there's, they're as far apart as they can be as far as what's the angle between them, All right? So. Uh, what's a good one that doesn't involve uh, BF2? Beryllium difluoride has a Lewis dot structure that looks like this. It doesn't actually satisfy our traditional Lewis dot structure requirements um, because the fluorine is so bad at sharing, it'll actually not let beryllium fill up its valence. It'll make a covalent bond with the beryllium, but um, not allow beryllium to actually you know, fill the valence shell. So if you have this molecule, what's the furthest apart you could get these two bonds? It's not in terms of distance, it's in terms of an angle. So 180 degrees. If you had three things attached to a central atom, here's another one that looks kind of funny. Um, boron trihydride. We actually don't have enough electrons to satisfy borons, to fill borons valence in this case, right? We only have six valence electrons to work with. So there's no lone pair, there's no pi bonds because hydrogens can't do that. What's the furthest apart these bonds could get from each other? 100 and... 20, 360 divided by three, right? So 120 degrees from each other. So it turns out that when we have these Lewis dot structures, we can actually use how many objects are there taking up space around a central atom to predict what the overall shape of the molecule is. So this shape is pretty straightforward. When you have three things in a straight line, what would you call the shape of that? If you had to take a guess. Linear, just straight line. If you have things in a straight line, they're linear. That's the definition of linear things in a straight line, right? So we'd actually just describe the shape of this molecule as linear. I'm not gonna make you guess for this one but you're close. It's going to use that tri prefix. It's called trigonal planar. So I don't know why they didn't say triangular planar. I guess because, I don't know. Trigonal planar. What does planar mean? 
not if we're if we're assuming we're not talking about Dungeons and Dragons here. Uh, a little nerd joke. Trigonal planar means what? They are on a plane. They're on the same plane, meaning they're flat. On the same, a planar object means flat. Like the surface of this table is planar. So the carpentry tool, a planar, literally is for making wood flat. It might be spelled differently though, because I think technically it comes from the put it on the same plane. So I think it's P-L-A-N-E-R in that case. But mathematically, this is what flat, how you say flat. Level, kind of. Did you, did you say level means the same thing? Level, I don't like level because level is bringing in that there's an, saying that there's an outside um, that's going to define. Level means that it's flat relative to the surface of the earth or earth's gravitational field, which is not always the same here. So this leads to what's called um, Vesper geometries, which stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion, which has always bothered me, the fact that they, it's not pronounced the way it's spelled. You say Vesper geometries, but it's spelled V-S-E-P-R, R, not E, for valence shell electron pair repulsion. Um, but just because it's a lot easier to say Vesper than Vesper, at least in English, for people who speak, are native English speakers. So what's gonna determine the overall shape of the molecule is just how many groups of electrons are there around that central atom. So turns out this is the number one place where Lewis dot structures show up. Lewis dot structures are really, really helpful for one, predicting where, where you have different types of bonds, double bonds versus single bonds, but also for figuring out what the shape of the molecule is going to be. And when I say the shape, I mean physically the shape of the molecule. They actually have to occupy space in three-dimensional space, so they're going to have a, a three-dimensional shape. So we're, we use the number of electron groups as a lone pair or an atom connected to a central atom. So what happens if we have, we'll look at CH4, Lewis dot structure for CH4, it's a molecule called methane, looks like this. Right number of electrons, everything has a formal charge zero, all the valences are filled. We're just gonna throw that up there and assume that everybody can follow our criteria now, even if maybe not quite as quickly as I can mentally. What's gonna be the angle between all of the hydrogens here? We would think 90 because what am I drawing on? What type of surface? A flat surface, 2D surface. We don't actually exist in a 2D surface though, do we? We exist in three dimensions. So if you have three, or if you have four groups of, of electrons taking up space, you get a three-dimensional object, right? which is called a tetrahedron. Tetra is the Greek prefix meaning what? Four, right? Like carbon tetrachloride from your nomenclature packet that I'm sure everybody's working diligently on over the weekend. Oh yeah. Almost done, right? So if we have three dimensions to work with and we have four groups of electrons, we make a tetrahedral geometry. I always remember, here's a, a good way to remember that tetra means four. Um, I always likened it to the classic 80s video game Tetris. Tetris still a thing. People know what Tetris is, right? Yes. What's the longest possible piece you can get in Tetris? Four. And actually, prepare to have your minds blown. Every piece in Tetris is made up of four squares arranged in different directions. They're all four objects. That's why it's called Tetris. 
from the Greek prefix tetra meaning four. Maybe that wasn't exactly mind blowing, but it was to me when I first put that together. If we're trying to draw this on a two dimensional surface, but it's a three dimensional object, we have to show with some sort of perspective, um, which how many of you have had an art class where you have to draw things using perspective? How many of you were, don't feel particularly comfortable drawing things in perspective freehand? Most of the same people, um, which is totally reasonable. Chemists are not known for being good artists, um, which is an unfair, but also accurate stereotype. Uh, so what we do instead is we just have, we have sort of a shorthand that we use to indicate whether something is sticking out towards you from the board or from your paper versus sticking away from you behind your paper, behind the board. When something is sticking out towards you, you draw it like it's a, a wedge. And if you're really being, um, want to make it look good, you can shade that in. That kind of looks like if you can picture, if a bond is like a really thin rectangle, if you take one end of that rectangle and you point it towards you, that end is bigger, right? So literally just is just a really, really simple way of indicating this bond is physically sticking out of the board towards the viewer. And for anything that's behind the board, we basically do the same thing, but with dots or dashes as they're called. Dashes mean something is going away from you behind the board or behind your paper. Right, so you don't have to be good at drawing things in perspective. You just have to know what the shortcuts are. For double bonds, we just try not to draw them into the board or out of the board. We try to draw them flat with the board and then you don't need to worry about it. What was that, Noah? To be, so, in the case of a tetrahedral geometry, basically there's there's only gonna be, there's six basic geometries, six, five, five basic geometries. This is the third of them because we had linear. We don't need to worry about drawing perspective for linear because it's in a straight line, right? Trigonal planar, planar being key phrase there, right? I mean, planar means it's flat also. So you don't need to worry about this. It's only when you get to tetrahedral and above that we need to worry about showing this. So basically for the tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal and octahedral shapes, you just kind of memorize what the standard way is of drawing it or just remember what the bond angles are between them and do your best to show that using these. So for tetrahedral is the only one that doesn't have nice, neat geometric angles. Um, a tetrahedral geometry has a bond angle of about 109.5 degrees. And that's measured, that's not an exact number. With trigonal planar, that was kind of an exact number, right? Because 360 degrees divided into three chunks gives you exactly 120. Turns out if you take 360 degrees in two dimensions and divide it up into four objects taking up space, you don't get an even number. So with that in mind, this is a measured number, 109.5 the rest of the geometries are all even numbers that you can get to by knowing basic geometry and knowing how three, 360 divided by an integer. All right, so the other, the other shapes. Uh, let's see, is that a good place? Here's, here is sort of nice figures, not hand-drawn figures of the other shapes. We have linear. Trigonal planar, tetrahedral. If you have five things taking up space, it's called a trigonal bipyramidal. So still trigonal, so still three things, but it called bipyramidal because it's like it's there's a pyramid up, a three-sided pyramid facing up, and then a three-sided pyramid facing down. And then lastly, if you have six electron groups. This is a, a bit of a disconnect if you're trying to follow along using the prefixes. Six objects around a central atom gives you an eight-sided surface. 
So it's an octahedral surface. And I'll draw that out and we'll draw those faces so you can see how that all works. But an octahedral geometry is really one of the simpler ones because everything is 90 degrees from everything else. Think about um, a dot in the middle of a cube. It's equal distances from all of the faces of the cube, right? They're straight up and then 90 degrees away is another face. 90 degrees from that is another face. So you wind up with all your bond angles being 90 degrees there. All right, and so I'm gonna spend some time talking about the shapes here and then we'll do some practice where we actually figure out what these different molecules are there. Um, initially, it's not that critical. It will wind up being important because that's actually how they determine the structures of lots of proteins, like say insulin, was they could say, okay, well, I've got an, a nucleus here and then this nucleus has two other nuclei nearby that are 109 degrees from each other. That means that carbon must have a tetrahedral shape and that you can figure out how, what's attached to what if you know how the bond angles work. Um, so for the trigonal bipyramidal, it's basically a trigonal planar structure. So the example that's given there is phosphorus pentachloride. If you think of a, a trigonal planar shape for three of the chlorines, so basically just a triangle with phosphorus in the middle and chlorine at each point, the last two chlorines are going straight up towards, you, towards us and straight away from us. Or you can think of it in terms of, see if I can actually draw this in. I think there's a three-sided pyramid-ish. Is everybody okay with my drawing skills? If you think of drawing an identical one straight down, it's a little lopsided. The phosphorus is right at the middle of that, of that uh, plane where they meet. And every one of the points is a chlorine. So you get a three-dimensional shape where you've got three chlorines in a triangular shape and then one straight up and one straight down. Right, the, and the, the standard way, quote unquote, standard way of drawing it, put your phosphorus in the middle and you're gonna say, okay, I've got a chlorine over here and then I'm gonna have a chlorine that's in the same plane but going into the board and a chlorine that's in the same plane, but sticking out towards us. And where do the last two go? If that, if we've got a triangular shape here, last two go straight up and straight down. All right, can there, if you're using your imagination, can everybody see how that kind of looks like two three-sided pyramids? Back to back. So, With a little bit of practice, you will be able to, right? All right, so the last one looks a lot like this, except instead of having three things in a plane in the middle, it has four things in a plane in the middle. So instead of being two, three sides stacked bottom to bottom, it's two four-sided pyramids stacked on top of each other. So what is the example as sulfur hexafluoride? So you basically have a square with fluorines at each of the points of the square. And then you're going to have a fluorine straight up and a fluorine straight down. Really, this should be drawn. 
that doesn't really look very good. Pretty convincing. Yeah. Well, I appreciate uh, your flattery. Um, right. So if again, make another D&D &D reference. If you've wow. ever played a game with with polyhedral dice other than just regular six sided dice, this is a D8. This is an eight sided die. Two pyramids on top of each other, two four sided pyramids on top of each other. And a tetrahedral shape is a D4. It's a four-sided die. And if you've never played games with polyhedral dice, what's wrong with you? No, I'm just kidding. It's it's okay. We I can bring some in even if, so you can see the shapes, but um, it just takes a little bit of practice to be able to see what these are gonna look like. All right, so I also included a table that has all of the standard ways of drawing them with the wedges and the dashes, showing that things are going into the board or out of the board. The other thing I want to look at is let's do some examples and try and look, pick which of these geometries are they going to pull, uh, fall into. So let's start with let's start with a simple one. Let's do CO two. I've already done the Lewis dot structure for CO two, but you might not remember it. If you do remember it, what does it look like? Yeah, we had carbon in the middle, oxygen on either side. We totaled up all of our electrons. We had uh, 16 electrons, right? So initially it looked like this. And then we, we made two double bonds to fill in the carbon's valence, right? Everybody with me? What's the, the shape of that molecule going to be? And why? Because it's because I drew them in a straight line? Yes. <laughs> There's only two things attached to the center carbon. So the furthest apart they could be is 180 degrees. Say that again. It can be oxygen up and down. That's the same molecule. I just remember these molecules are three-dimensional objects, right? So if I just take this molecule and I stand it on its end, then it's got the same shape, right? How come it's not tetrahedral? It's four pairs of electrons around the middle carbon. It doesn't have four oxygens though. So yes, it has four bonds, but these four electrons and these four electrons are stuck physically in the same space. They have to be right next to each other. So double bonds, triple bonds only count as one object when it comes to figuring out how many things are taking up space. Right, because they're stuck in the same general area. So the furthest apart the bond could be, be 180 degrees. That's a degree sign, not a six. All right, what about, let's see, we did sulfite at the end of class the other day for Lewis dot structure, right? Sorry, so for, for the shape of this molecule, we would look at this molecule and say that carbon is linear. It has two things taking up space around it. We had sulfite. Who remembers what the Lewis dot structure for sulfite looked like? So sulfite was SO3 with a minus two charge. So I believe this is what we settled on. And if you don't remember or have it in your notes, you can get to the reg to that structure for sulfite by following our regular rules, count your valence electrons, fill all the valences, make your formal charges close to zero. How many electron groups are there around that sulfur? How many things are taking up space around that sulfur? Four, six, 
Does that count as one object or two? It's a pair. Remember, electrons come in pairs because they can be spin up and spin down, right? So they're in the same spot. So that's one electron group. And does a, does a double bond count as two electron groups or just one? Just, just one, because they're they both have to be in the same space, right? So we have a total of four electron groups around this sulfur. There's that oxygen, that oxygen, that oxygen, that lone pair, four objects. And if you want an idea, here's another way you can get some physical intuition with how, what the shape of a tetrahedral geometry is. These all kind of look like they're balloon shaped, right? If you blow up three normal party balloons or four normal party balloons and hold them all by the knot at the same time, they'll naturally position themselves so that they're in a tetrahedral shape. Do the same thing with three balloons, they'll naturally position themselves so that they're trigonal planar because they're pushing each other away, right? You're holding them in the middle by holding the knots, right? So they'll naturally arrange themselves in these geometries, which is kind of cool. Yes. So these, these are what are called the ideal angles. These are the ideal geometries where everything is identical around the central atom. If you have one thing that's different than the ideal structure, or one thing that's different um, compared to the others. Like in this case, we've got lone pairs and then we've got three oxygens. The lone pair is gonna take up space differently than the oxygens. It's gonna have a different physical size. In our analogy with the balloons, think about blowing up one of the balloons bigger than the other three. It's gonna take up more space if it's bigger than the other three, right? So these ones wouldn't necessarily be 109 degrees and be something close to it. And so our electron geometry here, because we have four electron groups, our electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral. The thing is, we can't really see lone pairs. The way we measure where these atoms are is we literally fire, we get them into a crystal structure and fire x-rays at them. And you measure where the x-rays bounce off and use some uh, trigonometry and geometry to figure out where the nuclei are. If there's no nucleus, X-ray crystallography doesn't work. So we can't see these lone pairs. Not like we could see the, any of them with our eyes, but using that, that, technology, that technique with the X-rays. We can't see where the lone pair is, but we can see that it takes up space. So we have four things taking up space. So we'd say the electron geometry is equals tetrahedral. But as far as what we could actually see, we actually have a different name for it. The name for the, what we call the molecular geometry, if you have a tetrahedral electron geometry, four electron groups, if one of them is a lone pair and you can't see it, we call it a trigonal planar geom or sorry, trigonal pyramidal, excuse me a trigonal pyramid shape. So basically it looks like it's tetrahedral, but you can't see one of the points. If I was drawing it in three dimensions on the board, it would look something like, you've got a sulfur and down into, into the board, there's a, an oxygen and out coming towards us is an oxygen. And then down into the left is an oxygen. And there's a lone pair there, but we can't see it. So it's a tetrahedral shape, but we can't see that piece of it. All right, so we give it a different name. So that's, that's the one we call trigonal pyramid. And so in general, I'm not going to make you memorize the names of these ones. If you can draw it using wedges and dashes, that's good enough for me. You might find it faster or easier or more consistent to just have the names down. But in general, these are our four our um, major geometries. 
we've already, that we went through. And then basically you take one of these and replace one of the X's with a lone pair that you can't see. Or you replace two of the X's with a lone pair. And that's gonna give you a slightly different shape. All right, I know we're almost done here, but one more example just to get back to the question about different things taking up different space. Water, H2O, first, one of the first Lewis dot structures we did, right? Lewis dot structure looked like this. What's its electron geometry? How many things are taking up space? How many groups of objects are taking up space? Four. So it's also a tetra tetrahedral electron geometry, but because we can't see two of them, if we tried drawing this in three dimensions, draw a tetrahedral shape and it would look like this, but we can't see these. So instead we say that it's bent. The name of this shape is literally bent. And the bond angle between the hydrogens and the oxygens isn't 109.5. It's a little bit smaller because those, those lone pairs that are taking up space are bigger than the hydrogens are. So it winds up being about 105 degrees between those two atoms. All right, so we'll do more practice with this and start defining reactions on Wednesday. Yes, this will be in a test. Um, and so it, typically the way I test this part is it'll either be 10% or 20. At this point, it'll probably be 20%. I'll pet, give you a test on doing Lewis dot structures, and that'll be 10% of the test. And then I'll say, okay, and then given these Lewis dot structures, what's the geometry? You can give the name or you can draw it out as long as you can draw it out properly with the right angles about it. Okay, so either way works.